Okay, so what happened is that when I put out the core presentations, uh, Professor Franz Bayano Cambridge, who was with us in 2011 and last year and also 2012, he replied to me that and said that he was sorry he couldn't make it this time because he's still teaching at Cambridge. But if I wanted to, uh, he could send two of his employees that are working on the Pickle project. And he said one of them is, uh, is uh, yeah. even has a PhD in psychology. And I said, ooh, yeah, that would be really interesting because having a psychologist in here to talk about passwords would also add another dimension or another level into uh, our understanding or misunderstanding of passwords. And then Shunice uh, shows up and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm sorry I'm having to say this, but this is like a wet dream come true. We actually have a psychologist at the conference and, and didn't mean anything more than that about it, of course. <laughs> uh, and um, I've said enough. So, Shunice? Yeah, you. okay. So, um, as per already said, I'm Denise, and I'm not a computer scientist, I'm a psychologist. My undergraduate degree was in psychology, my PhD was in applied psychology and human-computer interaction, and I now work with Dr. Stiano and colleagues, one of whom is over there, called Chris, um, at the University of Cambridge um, on the PICO project, and the problem that we're trying to solve is how to replace passwords because they're very complex and there are very many of them, or you're supposed to have very many of them. So, I'm just going to move on. So, by far the most dominant form of authentication is passwords. And this is fine in principle if you could just pick one password. Um, but the fact is that, um, so the password has to be easy and, and, and it has to, and if for people to use it and it shouldn't be reusable, but people do use it, reuse it, and they, and they, are asked to pick quite complicated ones. Um, but the fact, uh, so um, that means that passwords have become impractical from a usability standpoint and vulnerable to attacks from a security standpoint. And the most um, obvious uh, usability uh, challenges with passwords is that you have to have a different password for each account and that they should be sufficiently long and complex with a combination of numbers, symbols, and letters. So, so, moreover, because users tend to be inaccurate about their perceptions of security, they tend to um, undermine system security by choosing passwords that are very crackable. And so this is because, unlike the typical computer geek, and that's you guys here, um, the typical user values usability more than they value security. So before I move forward, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to try and memorize this 12-letter sequence here. You ready? Don't write it down. Don't cheat. <laughs> Don't take a picture. Okay, so we've established what the main issues are, but what about the why? By, establish by establishing some of the psychological issues um, that underlie why choosers, users choose choosers? why users choose passwords that um, are weak, um, then we can capitalize on their abilities rather than working against them. And these are the psychological phenomena that I'm going to talk about. They're not the only psychological phenomena I could talk about, um, and they are quite closely related. Um, but I think they're the most relevant to what I'm talking about here anyway. So first I'm going to ask you if you could tell me what the 12 letter sequence of letters I asked you to remember was. Can anybody tell me? I'm going to go with you first because you were first, hand up. Yes. So how did you remember that? No, you said, what did you say again? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, so how did you remember that? What did you do to remember that? Uh, black and white, mm -hmm. uh, and then just cello, uh, and then where, but I knew that it was a bit sort of fuzzy bit off. Right, so you used um, a <coughs> technique called, uh, which is down here, uh, contextual association. So when we get to that, I'll describe that. So um, you nevertheless slightly found it difficult, even though you did it correctly, and I'm sure other people did it correctly too. 
Um, the, difficulty, the difficulty you likely experienced trying to remember the sequence is very much um, in line with how the human mind works and in particular how working memory works. And with working memory, the, the problem with passwords isn't their length, but their complexity, um, which means that... Um, where am I? Oh, what am I doing? Soz. <laughs> I'm in the right place now. Sorry, I got lost. Um, OK. OK, so ideally, they should be non-words consisting of random sequences of letters, numbers, and symbols. Um, so that they're not guessable or brute forceable. And there are two um, main methods for trying to recall a sequence of items that don't make up words. And the first is chaining, where you associate each item, each item cues the next item. And then you've got contextual association, where you associate each, each item in a series with um, a context that provides an ordinal cue as well. So um, that's those two. But the, the the main issue here is that memory span for words is always going to be better than memory span for non-words. So even when you use serial recall uh, techniques here, it's not necessarily going to be easy to remember truly random passwords. Um, and just to demonstrate how non-words are better than, uh, sorry, are worse than words, these are the same letters I showed you before. They're just in a different order now. And now it's a word I'm sure you'd be able to Call it easily. The other spelling was the Welsh word for wheelbarrow. Was it now? Damn it. There weren't any Welsh people in the room. Were <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so perhaps if users only had to remember one random sequence of, of letters, it wouldn't really be a problem. Um, but in reality, users have to remember tens of passwords and they're asked to make each one unique as well. So that's not really much good. Move on, please. There we go. OK. So these requirements <laughs> are not met because people are much better at remembering the meaning of a password than they are at remembering the superficial details that make up a password. Um, so unfortunately for the user, it's usually not enough to um, type in a password almost correctly so long as it has the same meaning or it has a similar spelling. And this is my cat Alfie, just, so, just to clarify. Um, and that is not my password, <laughs> just to also <laughs> clarify. OK, so uh, instead, uh, pass passwords must be entered verbatim, um, which requires knowledge of the account, of which account, which structure, or which password you need. Um, and as well as it not being easy to type in passwords accurately when you don't have the visual feedback, you usually have wee stars or, or wee dots, um, uh, details, unlike the meaning, tend to fade quickly and are susceptible to interference. And so to demonstrate this point, I'm going to ask you to try and remember as many details from this picture as possible. And again, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. <laughs> Can we run the Wix Wix bills of the same kind of uh, experiment uh, last year? Last yeah. Year. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm not that sorry. <laughs> Oh, like, they're just try and take in as much of the picture as possible. You only got five seconds, though. <laughs> and that's that. OK, so what was the picture of? An angel and a cherub. An angel and a cherub? What were they doing? Melancholy. Yeah. They were depressed because the passage had been compromised. OK. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you got, you got the just meaning. That's fine. Now for the details. Are you ready? How many rungs on the ladder? <laughs> How many rungs on the ladder could you see? Seven. <laughs> no cheating. I'm gonna make you guys put down on your laptops. <laughs> okay, true or false? Uh, the baby in the picture had wings. Well, you already said cherub, so that kind of gives away that answer. Uh, what inanimate objects could you see in the picture? Lots. Lots. Ladder. Ladder. Yes, correct. Yeah. It's unlikely that all of you are going to remember all the items. So you're all saying different items, but there's only one or two that you each can remember. And I didn't think that one through. So uh, <laughs> uh, how many squares made up the panel of numbers above Melancholia's head? Well done. <laughs> there was a devil in the picture, true or false? And how many nails were on the floor next to her feet? 
this is a picture again. So um, there was no devil, I'm afraid. There were four nails at her feet. A lot of people said to me, what nails? I was hoping for that, it was not worked out. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> okay, so this is what the picture looked like. It's related to the final memory issue I'm gonna talk about and then you're free of all the memory tests. Um, and uh, that is the difference between recognition and recall. But before that, I am actually gonna ask you to close anything that you have internet access with, because I don't want you to cheat for the next one. Like I mean it, like do it. <laughs> or else. <laughs> I see this, this computer open, that computer open, <laughs> that one's still open, that one's very much open. <laughs> You're not even trying to hide it, man. <laughs> Close your computer, I'm not gonna take answers from you. <laughs> you can, you can, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, everybody hands up in the air, right, okay, right. <laughs> oh God, right, uh, okay, so. Um, unsurprisingly, words are easier to recall than non-words. I've already demonstrated that. But more surprisingly, both words and non-words are equally easier to recognise and recall. So if passwords are supposed to um, meet regulations, which, you know, a random sequence of numbers, letters and, and symbols, how are we expected to recall them when recognition is better? And I'm going to demonstrate this by asking you to tell me um, in what order the Google colours appear. And I'm helping you because I've got the four colours there. It's just not in order. Is it? Yes. <laughs> no, you can't. Nobody. Oh, go on. No. Okay, fine. Um, okay, which of these is correct? Right one. Yeah. Right. So recognition is better than recall. Is my point. Um, okay. So now. Um, we are on to security-related issues. The security, risk that, um, the security risks that people are willing to take are largely dependent on the slowly evolved heuristics that um, we have evolved as a human species. And the fact is that the social and technological advances outpace our slowly evolved heuristics for perceiving risks in our environment. So, um, what example do I give? Okay, so... Attacks from a predator like this guy here, or a shark in modern day, is more vivid and more gruesome than the more abstract attack over here, which is a cyber attack. So, people, so it's more salient in their minds, which means people um, overestimate how probable this one is than that one. Um, so, yeah, because people are affected by salient occurrences, from 9-11 to shark attacks, which I've already said, um, rare events in modern society seem more probable. And this particular heuristic that I was just describing now is called the uh, availability heuristic. And there are exam several examples of the availability heuristic. Um, and probably the most notable is that people seem to be more afraid of flying than they are of driving a car, even though you're more likely to crash a car than you are to ever be in a plane crash. And the reason for that is that planes, uh, plane crashes tend to be reported on in the media. They also have quite gruesome outcomes. Um, and it's the same for um, people are more scared of like random acts of terror than they are intimate violence in the home, even though intimate violence in the home is far more likely to happen. And you've got others like people were scared of bird flu far more than they were scared of normal flu, even though normal flu killed way more people than bird flu did. Okay, so that's availability heuristic. You, people are also subject um, to a control bias. Um, where they think that things that are in their control, there's less risk associated with it. Um, so, um, for example, getting on a plane, you're not in control of flying that plane. Getting in the car, you're in control of, of, of driving the car. So, um, <coughs> password security too is very much in the user's perceived control, making users more likely to underestimate the risks associated with weak passwords. And people are often... Vi Finally, victims are often victims of the endowment effect, and I'm going to demonstrate this by asking you to think about how you'd answer the following question. You don't actually have to answer it, so you can pretend you got it right. Okay, so imagine a disease outbreak that is expected to kill 600 people. Choose between these two alternative treatment programs. Program A, 200 people will be saved. Program B, there is a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds probability that no people will be saved. Have you guys got an answer in your head? You can tell me if you want. No? Okay. 
Uh, okay, so um, A and B have the same utility. The only difference is that A is a sure thing and B is a risk. Uh, oh, wrong way. <laughs> and more people tend to choose program A over program B. If you think about these two options now, though, 400 people will die, and there is a one-third probability that no one will die, and a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. Which one would you then choose? <laughs> I read it out for you, like I did all the work. Okay, well, okay, that. <laughs> okay, so um, the only difference between these two options here and A and B um, was that A and B were um, presented in terms of gains, so how many lives saved, and C and D are presented in terms of how many lives are lost. Um, and so, despite this, though, it's the other way around. More people will choose program D than program C. Um, and what this means is that people tend to be more risk aversive when it comes to gains um, and more willing to risk losses than they are to risk gains anyway. So um, in terms of password security, this implies that people are going to be happy to risk some level of security um, associated with guessable or brute forceable passwords and unhappy to risk perceived usability gains associated with poor password practices. Not that there's any direct research done on this, so this is like an open area. Um, aside from being poor at evaluating the probability of risk, people are poor at evaluating the severity of risk. Um, and so, as well as overestimating the probability of more spectacular events, people underestimate the probability of bad things happening to them at all. So, um, things like smoking um, or eating badly have less immediate consequences, which also makes it less solid in your mind. So for example, if I were to eat a cupcake and it immediately went here, I would stop eating cupcakes. But because I can convince myself it's not that bad, I continue to eat them. Um, so <laughs> these are familiar and common risks that don't have immediate consequences. Um, and it's important because if people are getting the severity of risk wrong, then they're getting the security usability trade-off wrong. Um, and what's worse is that knowledge doesn't change behavior. Um, and so we like to believe that the more information we give users, the better they'll behave, but that's just not true. And governments continue to try and believe that too, with constant campaigns about stop smoking, it hurts you, and stop eating badly, it hurts you, drive with a seatbelt, because that doesn't hurt you, and it doesn't work, basically. Um, so, um, and this is because people rely on an optimism bias, um, which is when people believe that they'll do better than other people who are engaged in the exact same activity. And that's the sort of reason why people uh, don't always think, you know, cancer happens to other people, diabetes happens to other people, car crashes happen to other people, because of this optimism bias. Um, this heuristic is one possible reason for ignoring security risks, even after you've heard about a security risk elsewhere. Um, and the typical view of passwords is also supported by confirmation bias, which is when you seek out information that matches your beliefs and ignore information that doesn't match your beliefs, um, which means that people are likely to say, well, I've never been hacked, um, and use that as evidence for their behavior until they do get hacked, and then all of a sudden they'll change their passwords, but probably not to something majorly more secure. Um, so uh, this shows, I've got a study here that was done in the 60s, but it's really simple. Um, and what they did is they gave participants a deck of cards. And for half the participants, the deck of cards had 30% happy faces and 70% frowning, and vice versa for the other half. And participants were more accurate. Uh, uh, so they had to guess what card was coming next before they saw it. And um, participants were more accurate when there was 70% happy cards than 70% frowning faces. And um, what this shows is that users' preference or people's preference for positive things makes them less accurate about negative things. So um, if people don't value security guidelines and they can't follow them anyway, uh, what alternative could we offer? Whatever the alternative, it has to be in line with users' goals. And the everyday user is probably less concerned with authentication and more concerned with just signing into Facebook really quickly. So, um, or any other account or service that you have. So. The proposed solution for the PICO team is uh, PICO, obviously. Um, but there are other ones. So you've got other password types, password, graphical passwords, associated passwords, biometrics, and other hardware tokens. Um, 
what PICO is, PICO is an authentication scheme that was originally uh, presented by Stiano in 2011. It's a small dedicated device that remembers your credentials for you. So you've got from 25 passwords <coughs> to just the one device. Um, it doesn't have to, I mean, it can take on any form. It can take on a form from a key fob to a, to a watch. It doesn't have to take on this form, but what it does need to have is a camera to take a picture of a QR code, a display mm -hmm. for choosing between accounts, and a main button for selecting an account, and a pairing button for pairing a, an account with your Pico. And the main usability benefits are um, there's less of an impact on memory, less actual physical effort, and it's scalable for users. So. Okay, so um, users also do not have to worry about theft, and that's because they carry with them um, devices called Pika siblings that create like an aura of Eunice around yourself that tells the Pika whether or not you're near, and only unlocks when you're near. That you there should also be an orange. I failed. Uh, oh well. Um, yeah, so the Pika siblings share a cryptic. This is how it works, in my knowledge as a psychologist. The creepo the the Pika siblings. Um, share a cryptographic key, and when there's a sufficient number of them near the Pico, then the Pico unlocks. Um, so there are also other security benefits. It's con continuous authentication, and then resistance to guessing, phishing, and key logging. Um, before I invite any questions, yes, I know it's ambitious, but that's precisely why I'm doing it. I'm going to let you read the quote. Done. OK, questions. I'm, I'm a little bit early, I apologise. Could you go back to see how the roadblocks Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just like my quotes. Okay. Yes, sorry. Uh, your optimism bias. Yeah. Is that actually statistically true that bad stuff happens to other people? No. Yes, it is. No. There are so many other people compared to just me. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> no, but um, okay, optimism bias um, is something that we've evolved because if you started to see the world for what it actually was, you wouldn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly think that that's true. Like, obviously, that's not the academic answer, <laughs> but that's what they mean when they say that. I can't even find it. Oh, it's right there. There we go. Um, so yeah, it makes sense for you to believe things are going to turn out well. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep, you know, chasing the mammoth, the mammoth or looking for berries. Well, that's how politicians get. Um, yeah, power. yeah. Politicians use all sorts of psychology. Parts of this, we pretty much know that. Mm -hmm. People have to get compromised before they will. Yeah, you but I'm just saying that there's a psychological the reason for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but uh, I, I'm, I'm also curious about it. it I, at least much of I also feel that, I mean, I've been working for IT outsourcing for one, one nine years mm -hmm. uh, uh, until uh, a year ago. And I have done many security audits where I, where, have, where I have asked companies and people, why haven't you written any kind of description of what kind of security you want? Mm. or need and the answer has usually been well we are outsourcing to somebody we believe to be a, a professional provider of services so we expect them to have much better security than we ever had so we don't see any point in trying to tell them what kind of security we need or want because we just assume <coughs> they will be delivering good security Mm -hmm. That's also kind of, uh, I mean, um, it could be narrowed down to something as simple as my mother tells me that as long as the system allows me to use password one as mm -hmm. my password, mm -hmm. the system means it's good enough. And they could just I'm be done. passing responsibility as well, just so they're not responsible for any security breaches. Somebody else with more knowledge than you should tell you better. It's the logic that they're using. And mm. if you don't follow that, then well, I was just, I wasn't told to do anything else. Mm. So a good one as well. Question? Was there a question in there? Mm. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Would it be likely to actually change any of this kind of behavior in the course of the future? 
Because I mean, this is tightly linked to evolution, like mm. pure biology. If you, if you, if you uh, played on the right heuristics, yeah. <laughs> um, so what are those then? <laughs> I think um, I had one. I just left my head. I was going to say something. Because I mean, the media they, they're, and various governments mm -hmm. are quite into the whole "oh, be very afraid." Scenario. Yeah. The problem is, is that the government's focusing on knowledge, but when it actually comes to behavior change, or uh, according to uh, the theory of planned um, behavior, um, there. Are there's three things that affect your attention to change your behavior. And the first is um, subjective norms, so what everybody else is doing around you. The second is your attitude towards it, so whether or not you perceive the behavior to be positive or negative. And the third is what's been added recently and is quite important is perceived behavioral control. So how much control do you perceive yourself to have? So for example, if I wanted to get fit, yeah, it's a positive outcome. I, I view it positively, but I don't view the effort positively. I view that negatively. If all my friends were doing it, it might, you know, encourage me to do it a bit sooner. And if I thought, oh, but the gym's really expensive, and I don't have any gym stuff, and, you know, I don't want to be judged, and then that would, re you know, reduce it. So you have to consider all those three things. And surprisingly, knowledge isn't really in that, in that model. It's, it's attitude. You need to affect people's attitude, not feeding them knowledge. People just switch off. They think it's rubbish. And a lot of the time, I think people don't trust the government either. Like, why, no. are, they, why are they giving me this information? <laughs> so, yeah. If you wanted to change behavior, I'd probably go with one of the actual attitude behavior change models. But this is all social psychology. It's all... Heuristics and well, evolutionary. Let me ask you this: that I mean, obviously, you're working on a people project, I, a project that is, you know, trying to replace passwords. Yeah. But how should we go about to utilize this to make people create stronger passwords? I suppose you could scare them and make them think they had been hacked into. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be ethical. Like, um, okay, so if we go back to chocolate. give them chocolate. <laughs> Yeah, that would work but, for me. But we're inherently resistant to change as well, aren't we? Yeah. That complicated it depends on whether or not you've already changed your behavior once. If you've already changed it to be, which is unlikely, if you've already changed from a secure password to an insecure password or unsecure password, um, then you're not going to change it back again because you've gone through some sort of mental process to justify a change. So it depends. If, you can, if somebody has always used a terrible password and you can convince them to use a good one, it's unlikely they'll go back to using a bad one again. Sure. Positive. Because there are other things like how people are really, really good at falling back into bad habits. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, Dan Cable, uh, psychology professor. I'm talking about significant attitude change. Yeah, exactly. And he quoted a study that said I think more than 60% of patients that have undergone serious heart surgery mm -hmm. go back to eating. They yeah. go back to all their bad habits. I'm talking, um, I'm talking about. For example, I used to be a Christian, and then I went for a major attitude change, not just being a teenager. I mean, like, um, I, went, I went for a major change and decided I was an atheist. Now, it'd be extremely difficult to change me back into being a believer just because I already was one. I already went through the cognitive processes to make that change. Um, so for something major like that, somebody can't justify just flipping between those two major things back and forth. For something like eating badly, it's easy to just slowly slip back into it. Whereas something like your religion, what you tell people you are, is a little bit more serious, I suppose. Well, what you're saying is that for some changes, we haven't really gone through that process at all. No, there's no... So it's just like I, I wish I didn't have a belly rather than I wish I was fitter and I could run up the stairs and I could do this and I could do that. It's just it's different. So how do you induce that kind of change? Dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes? suppose you could get them to um, use the technique where you have like um, a sentence and then you get them to just you know do the beginning word of each sentence or whatever but I don't think you can stop that 
the whole point is I think passwords are crap, so that's why. <coughs> <laughs> Ooh, careful, careful, good one. <laughs> <laughs> Got Pico. I like the idea of Pico. Like, even I know, I, I use terrible tactics for passwords, and I know better, but I still do it. More questions? A more specific reference question, mm -hmm. really. Uh, when you talk about the games and models, mm -hmm. No, I didn't come up with that. I got that from this guy here. He's the guy that I quoted here. Yeah. Got it from him. But if you jump forward three slides, I think. Next one. Oh, not next. This. This one. No, I just created it, said it was. Yeah, you briefly mentioned yeah. uh, that you weren't sure if it was true because no direct research has been. Oh, I said I didn't know if it applied to passwords because oh, okay. no direct research has been done on passwords. So um, if you wanted to see if people were more likely to take risks with passwords if they were presented in terms of loss versus gain, then you might be able to find that out. I was just saying what this research implies is that passwords, people are more likely to choose less secure passwords because that's associated with a loss um, and less likely to give up, put risk, uh, risk the usability benefits of having a weak password that's easier to type in. That was my point. But very hard to quantify losses in, like in relation to bad passwords. Well, yeah, because it's, it's very... You know, people die. Yeah, that's why it would be good research, I think. Any more? Okay. Well, thank you, Jules. Okay. <laughs>